This the realest fucking shit I'll ever say in my life This the realest fucking shit you'll ever hear on the mic Better be quicker than lights or get 25 to life If your moves ain't precise, start singing for Christ But Jesus won't feed us if a nigga about to starve Been singing the same song and fretting behind them bars Under my feet is the lava, above my head The stars, where the fuck is hell and heaven? I'm compelled with lessons Like the shit Real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts. Real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Yeah. Real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Yeah. Where that nigga Machiavelli at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Nat Turner at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Jamie Foxx at? Real nigga. Where that nigga John Coltrane? Real nigga. Where that nigga Jay Z at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Benjamin Banneker? Real nigga. Where that nigga Samuel Jackson? Real nigga. Where that nigga Louis Armstrong? Real nigga. Where that nigga Master P at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Frederick Douglass at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Danny Glover at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Miles Davis at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Puck Daddy at? Real nigga. Where that nigga Harry Tubman? Real nigga. Where that nigga Whoopi Goldberg? Real nigga. When a nigga lean a hard at a real nigga Real, real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Real, real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Where that nigga Beyonce at a real nigga Where the real Rick Ross at a real nigga Where the nigga Washington Carver a real nigga Where the nigga Fred Hampton at a real nigga Where the nigga Maya Angelou a real nigga Where the nigga Jeff Ford at a real nigga where that nigga Malachi York a real nigga Where that nigga Angela Davis a real nigga Where that nigga Chaka Khan at a real nigga Where that nigga Rayful Edmund a real nigga Where that nigga Madam Walker a real nigga Where that nigga Asada Shakur a real nigga Where that nigga Oprah Winfrey at a real nigga Where that nigga Madam Sinclair a real nigga Where that nigga Colin Muhammad a real nigga Where that nigga Huey P. Newton a real nigga Real, real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back Real, real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Where that nigga Mayweather at a real nigga. Where that nigga Martin Luther King a real nigga. Where that nigga Eddie I mean a real nigga. Where that nigga Emmett Hill at a real nigga. Where that nigga Tiger Woods at a real nigga. Where that nigga Malcolm X at a real nigga. Where that nigga Chaka Zulu at a real nigga. Where that nigga Mike Brown now a real nigga. Where that nigga Bo Jackson at a real nigga. Where that nigga Marcus Garvey at a real nigga. Where that nigga Mansa Moose a real nigga. Where that nigga Trayvon Martin real nigga. Where the nigga Magic Johnson at a real nigga? Where the nigga Obama at a real nigga? Where's that Amistad shit full of real niggas? Pour out a bottle of Louis for real niggas. Real niggas spit ain't nothing but facts. Other motherfuckers back. don't got scars in their back. Jimmy Other Hennessy. motherfuckers don't got scars Louis in their back. Farrakhan. Other motherfuckers don't got George scars in their back. Real, real niggas spit ain't nothing but facts. Nat Other motherfuckers Cole. don't got scars in their back. Toronto Other Mike motherfuckers Jordan. don't got scars in their back. Other Rice. motherfuckers Rice. don't got scars in their back. Jack real, real niggas spit ain't nothing but facts. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. Joe Louis. Yeah, what y'all need to understand. Denzel Washington's racism talk. It, is that everybody here. wants to get into hip hop And y'all niggas can't saying. claim this 400, Yo, 500 years of slavery Charles like dog Barker. You understand this jazz, this rap, this rock Bob and roll Johnson. This pimping and hoeing, this gangster LA shit Reed. that we do We do because Michael that's how we got out of slavery, my nigga Trick that That's how we survived, my nigga So why you think this shit Carl is Tommy, a night Jay in the, the club This is our lifestyle Sure this is all the fuck we got. Understand that. Twist you ain't got the scars on your back, homie. It's not in your blood. It's in ours. And it will forever be. Know that. Real, real nigga spit ain't nothing but facts. Other motherfuckers don't got scars in their back. The niggas can't see how the business work. They got to come to the round table. That's right. With the God and Saturday. Right. Black pop. Right, that's what I'm saying. Hey, man, we got a. I got a presentation coming up. We ain't got the date set because we round tabling that's over right. here. We, we going, we going yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead.
uh, you know, this kicked out of heaven, you know, the untold history of the uh, white races from 700 to 1700 yeah. AD. We're going to go, boy, going in on your master. <laughs> Going in on your, on your granddad. Yeah, on Master Otherland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going in on Master once again. You know? Nah, nah, when I saw that beam, you remember that beam? When they shot, when they blew up Britain, and I saw that beam, when oh, they yeah. said, Lord, they done, they done blew up Master Otherland. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this shit is right here. This is Master Otherland. Okay, <laughs> this is Europe right here. You dig what I'm saying? We ain't got the date set, man. You know, this is a little short video. Mm -hmm. We over here, early bird, doing it, That's you know. Right. Get ready. Yeah. Getting ready to get big. Yeah. But most definitely, we gonna uh, get together. And uh, this is right up my alley. Yeah. And I really wanna uh, get down to some of the major uh, topics of the book. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, get back with me. Yeah, yeah. He gonna do the questionnaire. And see what's happening here is I'm gifting. This is when you do when you doing business, That's you right. got a gift. That's right. And I gift niggas who done put in the work. And he done put in the work with many documentaries, flying all across the globe, doing his lecturing. So this is gifting for men who put in work. This is for those who know me. You know what I'm saying? I gift Ooh, niggas. Right up my you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot more coming, man, especially for those who done help me out with the music and all of that. And the guy at 720, all on Amazon. Keenan Booker, all on Amazon. You can you can uh you know, put both names in the search engine and different products to pull up. That's you right. dig what I'm saying? So, right. yeah, we, we making this real early. This ain't number two, three minutes, man. Let y'all niggas know how we do in Vegas, man. Early bird, get the worm. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Bangonthebeast.com. Yeah, bangonthebeast.com. He got the, tell him about the come ups. You got this, this is already in stone, man. Oh, man, uh, um, July the 9th, I'm gonna be in Dallas. You know, uh, Pan-African Connection. Uh, brother Ro uh, Robert uh, West down there. Uh, I, I might even fuck his name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we just you know July 9th you gonna be where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Dallas, okay? Y'all look out and y'all y'all put some y'all go check it out with, and see what's what's going down, man. What you gonna be talking about? Oh man, uh, the revolutionary history of ancient Kim. Oh, okay. That's right. And that's all. Yeah. Warrior. Yeah, the warriors and the conflicts. That's right. Right, right. So you know, that's how we. That's what we're gonna be talking about, man. Y'all check out the guys 720com Y'all check out Kicked Out of Heaven, Black Man's Bible. We doing it, all right? Black power. Yeah. Kicked out of heaven. This is what the book looks like right here. Okay. And this is what we will be discussing today. This is the second lecture to this book. Uh, my name is Kenan Booker, and I just decided to do 
a three volume series on a uh, thousand years of Europeans. Okay. There's a lot of reasons why. This area is called, this medieval time from 700 to 1700, it's called the Dark Ages um, for a lot of reasons. And we're going to talk about that today. This is the second lecture to this book. The book is 525 pages. Um, the first lecture was done actually before the book and while I was gathering a lot of material. And that's the torture lecture. Okay. And, the, and But all the other material in the society, okay, is found um, you know, in, very, in very scattered areas. I had to collect a lot of information to get the full picture of what was going on on everything in the society. All right. And that's because it was connected with the torture. The torture is the second part of the book. We will be discussing in this film the first part, the third part, and the fourth part which is dealing with exclusively the environment in the first part, in the third part. We're talking about the way the males lived, which was the knights and the nobles and all of that. Okay, the knights, the nobles, the lords, and whatnot. And how the hierarchy system worked, and specifically the peasants, because 90% of European society during these times were, uh, was, the peasants, okay? Now, and this one, we so right here on the back of the book, this is what the back of the book looks like. Um, and we will be discussing 100 pound hailstones, sexist streets, the origins of the cuckold, hom homosexual molly houses, the order of the beggars, torture devices, uh, the animals that had lawyers in court, which is a part of the torture section, the medicinal cannibalism, which is also a part of that, the, uh, the food, black, Puddings and ill pie and what that is, you know, their, hy their hygiene, you know, the, uh, the government sanctioned prostitution, how, how they raise their infants, and, you know, the sexual backwardness, um, incest marriages, the insane kings, demented queens, so on and so forth, okay? Now, first we need to go over epigenetics. I'm going to read specifically what it says here. Okay. Bruno Latour states, Humans are exchangers and brewers of time. Some of my genes, Latour points out, are 500 million years old. Others, 3 million. Others, 100,000 years. And my habits range in age from a few days to several thousand years. And that's exactly the truth. So, every human is composed of genes that range in a lot of different ages, that range in different ages, and also maintain habits and intelligence from all these different time periods. So, pertaining to your culture, your geographical location, on where your lineage has been, and the traumatic events that have occurred in, in that area, in your time space, will be downloaded into the genes. Epigenetics is the study in the field of genetics of cellular and physiological phenotypic trait variations that are caused by external or environmental factors that switch genes on and off. This affects how cells read genes instead of being caused by changes in the DNA sequence. Hence, epigenetic research seeks to describe dynamic alterations in the transcriptional potential of a cell. These alterations may or may not be heritable, although the use of the term epigenetic to describe processes that are not heritable is controversial. Unlike genetics based on changes to the DNA sequence, the genotype, the changes in gene expression or cellular phenotype of, of epigenetics have other causes, thus use of the prefix epi, over, outside, of, and around. Okay, so like I said, the environment and things that occur in the environment, okay, that may be traumatic, will download into the DNA, and that will pass on to the children, can, cannot, and due to the fact that you're dealing with a mother and a father, different things will pick up, okay? Now, 
according to the new insights of behavioral epigenetics, traumatic experiences in our past or in our recent ancestors' past leave molecular scars adhering to our DNA. Jews, whose great-grandparents were chased from their Russian chalets, Chinese, whose grandparents lived through the ravages of the Cultural Revolution, young immigrants from Africa, whose parents survived massacres, adults of every ethnicity who grew up with alcoholic or abusive parents, all carry with them more than just memories, like silt de uh, deposited on the cogs of a finely tuned machine after the sea water of a tsunami recedes, our experiences and those of our forebears are never gone. Even if they have been forgotten, they become a part of us, a molecular residue holding fast to our genetic scaffolding. The DNA remains the same, but psychological and behavioral tendencies are inherited. You might have inherited not just your grandmother's knobby knees, but also her predisposition toward depression, caused by the neglect she suffered as a newborn. Okay. So, I state that, I put that in here so we understand that everything that is being explained throughout this book, volume one, volume two, and volume three, is specifically based upon the epigenetics the epigenetic theory and fact as we all know it is um, because there's a lot of activity that Europeans have been committing for a very long time that we do not know why or how and um, why I mean what, I'm, when I say how I mean their activity is, is, is at a capability to be blind towards human sympathy okay meaning their violence is at a is at an extreme rate, and their insanity is at an extreme rate. And we're going to be going through all the different avenues that to try to to rewire what may be downloaded in indigenous people from um, these experiences, and that's also correlated with Europeans because they are at a are in a different geographical location being here in America as they're not originally from here either. So, they've, breaking the, they've broken the European cord in a sense. The activity has been maintained through secret societies and all of this other stuff and other things that they enforce for maintenance of dominance, which, you know, that's just part of the picture. So, whether it goes, whether you want to rewire your brain from these scenarios, or if you want to encode the intelligence of dominance, that's both structured inside this literature in this book, okay? So, this is very important right here. Now, um, we have uh, this, the, the medieval climate, and the climate is very important because we're, we're, going, we're, we're going extremely up and extremely down. Okay. This down period, these down periods right here are called the Little Ice Age. So as you can see in 700 where, I wrote, where I'm starting to book at, okay, it's uh, very low. The Little Ice Age is over here documented to be in the 1700 time period. But it was also other points of extreme cold like in this 1300 right here. Okay? And then it went extremely up. And then there was an extreme hot season too at around 1000. So all of that is inside the literature. There's a lot of uh, things because of this weather change um, that the, they weren't able to have their food prepared. There was famines that occurred. There was plagues that occurred and the weather was extremely odd, okay? And it, there's, I have the first chapter is about 40 to 50 pages of nothing but weather events. So we can get a thorough understanding of the unpredictability that was encoded inside their system coming from unknown sources. So this may be a reason on why there's so high rate on, on security, okay? Because, um, we'll, let's read some cases here from the weather. Now, 850, 851 AD and 850, a famine prevailed in Paris, France in the year 851 and 852. The sun was glowing extremely hot in Gaul, Western Europe, Germany and Italy, the drought was so great that food shortage for the cattle occurred. It became clear that a terrible famine was beginning. 
which continued to the year 855. There was so great a drought over all of Italy and Germany as caused such a famine that parents ate their own children and children ate their parents by a plague wherein the throat being obstructed by great defluxions, inflammations, the sick died suddenly. In Poland, there was a great frost. In England, there were great rains and floods, followed by an epidemic of Quincy. In Scotland, a four-year famine began. The winter in, 18, in 856 was very harsh and very dry. A violent epidemic pulled out many people. So we see that in all locations, in all different locations of Europe, they had something going on. And that's usually the case. And um, we're going to go in a little bit further about that too, on uh, why this time period is considered all just Europe. There was no real extreme division on what land was what, because anything could change overnight, all right? And the reason it being anything could change overnight was because of these type of weather events that would wipe out whole towns um, and uh, just completely destroy the financial structure of a city. There was also plagues, as mentioned here with the Quincy, the epidemic of Quincy. And we'll be going over the plagues in volume two, okay? The plagues aren't talked about in volume one. The plagues, the diseases, the different forms of insanity, the manias, all of that is in volume two. So, 874 AD, France, the heat of summer was long, I mean, the heat of summer in long duration caused the pastures to dry up and this resulted in a shortage of grains. As a, re as a result of the famine and plague in France, one third of the population was swept away. In 874, a plague of ugly deformed locusts ate up the fields in France. They had six feet and two teeth harder than stone. So numerous were they that they darkened the sun. And one day and night, they eat up all greens and trees. But strong winds drove them into the sea and they were drowned. The waves cast their bodies ashore where the putrefaction proved fatal to many. So that by famine and plague, a third part of the people died. Now, pay attention to that process right there and also what was maybe mentioned with the locusts. That's, uh, I think that's similar to the, this, the, uh, the seven days in Egypt when they got hit with the plague and everything. And this was part of it. And we have to understand that a lot of the European experiences is really, uh, have, has been encoded inside the Bible. And when they say the uh, locust, well, I mean, it's not encoded, but it's built up to encode your psyche to be European without you knowing by the compiler of stories. So you see, once I tell you the story that you imagine in your mind, and if I repeat it in, into your mind enough, it's going to embed it that it was in a real activity, okay? Or it may open up the cells in your DNA for that time period and correlate to the time, which is already in your blood, as we stated before with that genetics, okay? So, we have to understand that when locusts get high in the sky, they can, uh, their length can stretch up to five miles and their width can stretch out to two miles. So, they will black out the sun, okay? And that is, um, there's, there's real stuff right there. That's, that's the facts behind it. Now, 1000 AD France experienced a famine in the year 1000. The cause was rather unusual. The year 1000 was a time of extraordinary suffering for the whole country was seized with a panic, fearing that the world would come to an end during this, the millennial year. Thousands went on pilgrimages, des deserting their homes and their fields and obstructing the whole normal course of their existence since the fields were left unplowed and unplanted and since the world did not come to an end, starvation set in. You know, ever since the beginning of time, man has been preparing for the end of time, and it hasn't come yet. So, that's just another story right there to show you how deeply involved into the psyche we are, as when we came into the year 2000, we had the Y2K situation, and also we had the 2012 quote-unquote hoax that occurred where it was supposed to be the end of time, and there is no end of time, okay? 1024 AD, in Russia, there was a major famine. There were 38 major famines in Russia between 1024 and 1936. 
Many of these famines were accompanied by such horrors as eating tree bark, grass, dung, and cannibalism. Okay. In 1033, in 1033 AD in Gaul, Western Europe, the winter was severe. In Switzerland, the imperial army of Emperor Conrad II suffered from suffered much from the cold. The weather in 1033 was ominous. The temperature in Gaul, Western Europe was so unfavorable that farmers could not sow or harvest because the fields were constantly flooded. Because of the incessant rains, it was believed that it would take three years for the soil to become suitable for sowing furrows. A bushel of grain was sown in the fertile land. When harvested, the grain yielded only a sixth of a bushel, hardly a handful. A plague started in the east after ravaging Greece. The plague came to Italy and spread to Gaul, Western Europe, and did not even spare England. Individuals were forced to eat grass and animals that had fallen dead animals, of course. The people killed themselves in order to consume themselves. Some children were tempted with an egg or an apple in order to lure them away. These children were then killed for food to satisfy their hunger. This madness, the frenzy grew so that the animals were safe to escape death. When the people nourished themselves on human flesh, even though this crime was punishable with the stake, uh, some people who starved so long that when someone arrived to nurse them back to health, they ate a full meal and fell over dead. The refeeding syndrome. It was generally believed the order of the seasons and the elements had ceased. The year 1033 in France was noted for its rain, but it was also distinguished for its great calamities. All the elements were engaged in a war for three years running. The seasons were contrary to sowing crops. Okay, so the refeeding syndrome is very important, okay? And that's why I put that in there. Um, because I've never heard of a refeeding syndrome. And for somebody to be so, um, you know, in such a starving state that their bo whole body has reorganized its, uh, its eating structure, then when you actually consume some food, it shocks the body into death. That, you know, that's heavy. And they were going through experiences like this at 1033. I haven't heard of this type of activity in anybody else's history yet. I still, I'm still got more to do. So in 1312 AD, a three year famine struck Bohemia and Poland. This famine was so great and severe that children devoured their parents and parents ate their children. Some fed on the dead bodies of malefactors hung up on gibbets. And the gallow type structures from which the dead bodies of executed criminals were hung on public display. Wolves also were so famished that they devoured all they met and fed on them. Few English kings have lived through a greater period of distress than Edward II. He was scarcely able to secure food for his own immediate household when the heavy rains of 1314 spoiled the harvest. Misery in England was widespread and intense. The dead lined the roadsides, everything imaginable was eaten, dogs, horses, cats, even babies. The jails were crowded with felons, and when a new criminal was thrown into a cell, he was seized upon by the starving inmates and literally torn to pieces for food. In England in 1314, grain spoiled by the rains, uh, famine so dreadful that the people devoured the flesh of horses, dogs, cats, and the vermin. Uh, Parliament passed a measure limiting the price of provisions. Okay, now, um, That's very important right here, and, the, and what's important is the baby comment. You have to hold on to that for volume two. There's a lot of stuff about eating babies that we're gonna be going across. And there's a lot of it mentioned here in this book, but volume two has the real source of it because it deals with their magic, okay? Or what they may have thought was magic, okay? It was just really high level insanity. So, let me see here. In 1483, the rivers of Bern in England overflowed during 10 days and carried away men, women, and children in their beds and covered the tops of many hills. The waters settled upon the land and were called the Great Waters for a hundred years after. This event occurred during the first year of King Richard III's uh, reign. Another account places this event in 1485. 
1485 in England, for a long time, there were continual rains and great moisture swelled rivers, especially the rivers of Rhine, which was so high for 14 days that it overflowed the whole country and drowned many people in their beds, overturned houses, carried about children swimming in their cradles, drowned, be drowned uh, the beasts grazing on the hills. In 1505 AD, uh, because of a great famine in Hungary, parents killed and ate their own children. In 1510 AD, in England, there was excessive heat in Italy. There was a hailstorm which destroyed all the fish, birds, and beasts of the country. Some of the hailstorms weighed 100 pounds. In 1600 AD, Russia went, hold on, before I continue right there. Uh, hailstones weighing 100 pounds. That's pretty outrageous. There's also, inside the book, it's also documented of them uh, having 15 inch uh, wide hailstones in circumference, 15 inches, okay? So, that's pretty serious right there. Now this picture right here, that's up on the wall, is from, uh, is from Russia when they were having a famine in the 1800s, okay? I thought it was important to put it up there because uh, you know it's real time. It's, it's not a, a placing. Okay. Now, in 1600 AD to 1602, Russia, one of the earliest famines in Russia of which there is any definite record, was that of 1600, which continued for three years, with a death toll of 500,000 peasants. Cats, dogs, and rats were eaten. The strong overcame the weak, and in the shambles of the public markets, human flesh was sold. Multitudes of the dead were, fo were found with their mouths stuffed with straw. The winter of 1683 to 18, uh, to 1684 was severe in Europe. There was very severe cold in Paris, France from 11 to 17 uh, January. Uh, during those seven days, the alcohol decreased in the bowl, down to a point where it had not yet reached during other winters. The academics timed how long it would take wine to freeze and open. It took 10 to 12 minutes time. There was an extraordinary amount of snow in the south. The effects of the cold were very significant, especially in England, at London, and River Thames. It was during a large part of this time frozen so strong that huts and booths were erected on the ice and a market was held there for 14 days. Now, the pic now this uh, market that they had on the Thames River because the ice was so thick, I do have a picture of it. There's drawings of this. And I have one that's inside the book. I do have other drawings of disaster events that were done in paintings that will be shown inside the third volume as the third volume is a picture book. Okay, now, we have, and also on that river things, well, it was kind of funny, I, I read some information that they even roasted, a, they spit roasted a bull to, to test the water. They're testy people. They like to play with the edge of death, as they're very familiar with death, as we can see here in this picture. These two people on the back are uh, the parents, and they're selling their children on the table. Okay, now, these are some of the living conditions. I thought this was important. I mean, we, we needed to draw the entire, I needed to give you a full picture. We're time traveling here of what was going on on every day, so here we go. Main streets were paved and wide enough to accommodate two carts or carriages, while the rest of the streets were narrow, muddy, and uh, melodorious, with a gutter running down the middle. For the average citizen, the rule for elimination was all in the street, and in lower class quarters, a pile of hors d'oeuvre, feces, usually lay at every doorway. Householders were supposed to carry the deposits of disposal pits and were reminded by repeated ordinances to pave and sweep their doorsteps. There's, uh, there's evidence of this in, in TV shows like Game of Thrones, okay? And if you pay attention to the full scene of what's going on with the camera, you'll see a lot of stuff in the background, and a lot of this it fully explained to you that it is fact. So if they're going to put it in those type of rooms, and inside of media and the movies, then you best believe that's exactly the conditions, okay? Um, now, when you look at pictures, in, uh, in the countries of Europe, the streets that they use today, where the cars are at, used to be this sewer that was running with nothing but dead bodies and feces and, you know, 
everything else in it, okay? Hay, rats, vermin, everything else, okay? Now, traffic jams block the narrow streets with packed mules with uh, baskets hanging on either side, met street vendors with their trays of porters bent under loads of wood and charcoal. Tavern signs on long iron poles further crowded the streets. Shop signs were gargantuan, the better to overwhelm customers, since shopkeepers were forbidden to call to, bu to buyers until after they had left the neighboring shop. A tooth puller was presented by a tooth the size of an armchair, a glover by a glove with each finger big enough to hold a baby. Okay, so what that saying right there is, you know, the reason why I put that there is to show you how your, shite, how your psyche is extremely shaped by just like Caucasians, just from the environment that we are in, okay? So the billboard signs that are humongous and the signs that's marketing to you hanging off the front of the building, which I do have a picture of this from a lot of old signs that would hang off their storeways, their store doors. I have a picture of it from a museum inside the book, okay? And um, also to show you that traffic jams, which this is documented to be activity that was going on in the 1200s. Now, the, um, we, we didn't have traffic jams in other locations, okay? And the reason why I put that there is because the traffic jam being your external environment is a symbol of your internal environment, which is a symbol of congestion, okay? So, when we talk about today, and you got those who are in traffic jams, right? Are they living a good life? Have you ever heard anybody living the good life in the traffic jam after work? You're cussing, you're mad at the radio, you gotta turn the radio up loud, you gotta go get the bullshit food because you're in the traffic jam, you see? And it's already building anger, frustration, and congestion in the mind. Disease, okay? Settles in, okay? And we will be talking about how the disease, we will be talking about the full psychological position of disease in the medical in volume two. And you will see the correlation as they, autom as they knew during these times that mentalities settle in disease. So, living condition. Dogs, cats, pigs, and sheep wandered freely through its dark wooden arcades. The pigs, especially contributing to the filth and smell, voracious feeders, quarrelsome and unsociable. They were the subject of constant complaints for biting and, in one case, eating a child, for which the guilty animal was executed by hanging regulations prohibit, prohibiting the keeping of pigs in the city and the disposal of their ordure in the river had little effect. Now. The case of the pig eating the child, which there's more than one, is documented inside this book as well. As you also see the documentation of the environment was showing you that they had pigs and all that other type of stuff. They were running around, they were everywhere, okay, in the city. They were having sex everywhere, you know. It was, they watched all of this type of activity, it was wholesale to see, okay. And I'm saying that for the children too, so you can understand. The comfortability and the relation with the Europeans and these farm animals because when we, when you're born in America, that's, that's what gets pumped in your face first for your little fairy tales and your folklore is farm animals, right? The Charlotte Web, right? Okay, so England had plenty of poor people. In the early 1700s, there were roughly 10 million people living in England and an estimated two million were vagrants, rogues, prostitutes, beggars, or indigents. Living conditions for the very poor were meager in the mother country. In one parliament study of the 18th century workhouses, only seven out of 100 orphans survived more than three years. Working people found day-to-day -day life challenging in the initial phase of industrialization. Predictability, alcohol consumption was a serious problem. The average Englishman consumed more than a gallon of spirits a week. This was at a time when the average work day was 12 hours and the average work week was seven days, okay? So, the, basically, the comparison here is, the, is the, the rate of the working, which is also connected with the alcoholism, which is also connected with the child neglect, which is also connected to the child death, okay? And this is in the early 1700s, so we have to understand that this is late in the day. This is when slavery was going on in America, 
this is what was going on in Europe. And this may be part of the reason why Europe has a little bit of a different history than what uh, America does when it comes to the whole slavery picture. And that's, that's something we did not, I did not talk about that area inside that book because that's not the focus. The focus of this book is extremely the social and the psychoanalytical to break down the social ills that may be stemmed to you that you know nothing about because you're enforced underneath another culture. So animals could have no, no, no human feelings. During this age of reason, some an, uh, anatomists who followed uh, Descartes, that's how his name is uh, pronounced, administered beatings to dogs with perfect indifference and made fun of those who pitied the creatures as if they had felt pain. They said the animals were clocks, that the cries they emitted when struck were only the noise of a little spring, which had been touched, but that the whole body was without feeling. So, when we talk about a lot of torture that was going on in the market, then we also talk about the animals being around everywhere in the city, and we also talk about uh, the, the animal consumption it shows us that there was an attitude towards animals where they weren't a living thing. As it says here, the noise that they made when struck was nothing but a spring. So, anything that they classify as an animal will fall underneath the same uh, level of respect and intelligence. So this will give us what we see when it comes to the whole slavery picture that happened when we were in America. If we classify all other beings on the planet as animals, okay, then we can treat them in this fashion and we will not feel any sympathy from it or any guilt complex from it. Now, the garter robes, the laboratories, uh, or I mean the, the lavatories is what I meant to say, sorry about that. A curious medieval euphemism which has been revived in more modern times is a cloak room where they were constructed at all were often placed on the upper floors of townhouses so that the hole was conveniently high above the pile of dung. Often garter robes projected from the house over the space between the side wall and that of the, of the neighboring house so that the pile grew up neatly out of the way of the front door but still accessible for cleaning out from the street. Other garter robes actually discharged directly into the streets and Abigate, a lane leading to the river from Dame Street, became virtually impassable because of the number of overhead hazards. Okay? So, this is also where terms like look down below come from. Where that's all you had to do is yell out look down below or guard a loo. And that will state that your, your, uh, your feces, your shit is coming out the window. Okay? And if you got hit with it, and this is maybe, this is part of the reason they wore wigs, huh? Part of the reason why they started wearing all the crazy wigs <laughs> because shit was flying in their head all the time. Right, so, and those are the pictures from it, okay? That's, a, that's an actual one right there, all right? So now, the, uh, the bath houses. So, we're gonna break down a little bit of the story of uh, how the bath houses of Europe actually come from Islam. It is a fact and it cannot be ignored that Europe is founded, Europe is based, there is no Europe, there is no Christianity without Islam. There is Judaism without Islam, but there is no Christianity. There may be a little Catholicism, there's Catholicism without Islam. But there is no Christianity without Islam. Let's keep that clear. And there is no occult structure for Europe without Islam neither. Let's keep it. So when it comes to their hygienics, when it comes to their mathematics, when it comes to their medical, when it comes to all of that, uh, it is not there. And when I say Islam, I do speak of the Moors, Turks, the Arabs. There's a mixture and a composite of a lot of different groups. The Saracens, the Tartars, you know, the Ottomans. There's a lot of different ones. And there's a, there's a sprinkle of their information all throughout. So, but anyways, let's keep going. Now, the bad houses. The Crusaders had brought back many superficial features of Mohammedan civilization with them. 
And when they say crusaders, have brought back many superficial uh, features of the Mohammedan civilization, we, we can relate and immediately point our finger to the Knights Templars, okay? Now, as a small return for the wastage of man, uh, of, men, of men and resources in hopeless campaigns, sugar and maize, cotton, muslin, and damask, glass mirrors, lemons, and melons were some of the material things while words we use such as chemistry, algebra, alcohol, tariff, and corvette are reminders of the preeminence of the medieval Arabs in the world, worlds of science, trade, and navigation. Among these refinements of like the Crusaders also brought back the idea of the Hammam, the Turkish bath. Whatever the reason bathing ceased, European had adopted a civilized custom from the east, adapted it, corrupted it, and destroyed it. Little wonder that the Arabs and Turks regarded Westerners as filthy in their habits. Glory be to Allah, my child, that you have come safely out of their hands. The people who now live in the city are invaders from the black lands of the West, says an old gardener in the tale of Kamar el Zaman and Princess Bur uh, Budur. They came up suddenly out of the sea one day and massacred all the faithful. They worship strange and incomprehensible things and speak an obscure and barbarous language. They eat evil-smelling, patrician things such as rotten cheese and game, which they hang up. They never wash for at, at their birth. Ugly men in black garments pour water on their heads. And this ablution, accompanied by strange gestures, frees them from all obligation of washing for the rest of their lives, that they might not be tempted by water that they at once destroyed the hammams and public fountains of building in their uh, places, shops where harlots sell a yellow liquid with foam on top, which they call drink, but which is either fermented urine or something worse. And their women, my son, are the abominations of calamity, like the men they do not wash, but they whiten their faces with slacked lime and powdered eggshells. They do not wear linen or drawers to protect them from the dust of the road, so that their presence is pestilential and the fire of hell will never clean them. Okay? That, that is, uh, <laughs> that is a, a statement written by... That, I think that statement is found in the Thousand Nights, the, the Thousand One Arabian Nights. Now, don't quote me on that, but it is... Re, uh, reference properly inside the material in the book, so you can get directly where that state where that statement is found. Now, for the great mass of, medi of medieval Westerners, all these all these criticisms were only true. The bath survived in the ritual of the Order of Chivalry instituted by Henry IV, 1367 to 1413, at his coronation, but never really organized until the reign of. George the first, 1660, 1727. So, the bath was introduced in the late 1300s, but never concretely hit Europe, and was uh, spread amongst all the lands until 300, 400 years later. So, and we have to pay attention to that, because there's always 300, 400 year loops with what's going on with uh, Europeans. So, these are the bathhouses. This is important, okay? Now, as we can see, they have a bed here, okay? And as you can also see, they have tables in between the, uh, in between the tubs that they're in, okay? So what's happening here is they, they eat food and they play games and they do all of that, but they sit in this wood tub, it's usually wood, and they don't change the water. So you sit in there with a mate or sometimes or mostly a stranger, okay? And um I think there's some mistakes. But um, as you can see in the picture over here on the right, it's the same situation when they're in the wood tub. And this gown, this see-through gown that they're wearing, um, they would wear, they would bathe in these gowns, they would bathe in the clothing. Okay. Now, as you can see here, another situation where they have the beds right here, right next to where they uh, are also bathing at and eating food and all of that. So, what, what you're seeing here is the bed right here. What you're seeing here is the activity of uh, 
the brothel is going on. A large mixture of DNA is going on. And you have to main, you have to understand that principle. Okay? That all their filth, they accept each other's filth, they bathe and loathe in each other's filth. They will drink, there's I have statements inside the book of them drinking this bath water, so on and so forth. And they mix. They all become one genetic thought pattern. So let's go. Now, this is the money. Now, I got this picture up here because the money uh, changes. Whenever the king came in, you know, whatever his symbol, his family crest was, whatever uh, he was named as, you know, John the Lionheart or whatever the case, that was what was stamped on the metal, on the, on the coins, okay? And that also goes for uh, his religious faction or whatever the case as well. So, money could buy any kind of dispensation to legitimize children of which the majority were those of priests and prelates. Out of 614 grants of legitimacy in the year 1342 to 43, 484 were to members of the clergy. So it's showing you that the, you know, they had a lot of Ill uh, illegitimate children and they would legitimize them just by paying the court. You could do anything with the dollar bill, basically is what I'm saying. So, to divide a corpse for the favorite custom of burial in two or more places, to permit nuns to keep two maids, to permit a converted Jew to visit his unconverted parents, to marry within uh, the prohibited degree of consanguinity, uh, with a sliding scale of fees for the second, third, and fourth degrees, to trade with the infidel Muslim, with a fee required for each ship on a scale according to cargo, to receive stolen goods up to a specific value, the collection and accounting of all these sums, largely handled through Italian bankers, made the physical counting of cash a common sight in the Papal, in the papal Palace. Whenever he entered there, reported Al Barpaleo, a Spanish official of the Curia. I found brokers and clergy engaged in reckoning the money which lay in heaps before them. Okay? So the same church and state, the clergy, okay, and the brokers. There's church and state, and this was going on in the 1300s before slave ship was even thought of. Okay, now this is very important right here because I hear a lot of people always talking about the lottery. The lottery started in Harlem. No, 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 no. The lottery did not start in Harlem. They did not. Slaves did not run numbers, okay? The first lottery in England, as far as it is, as far as, far as is ascertained, began to be drawn on the 11th of January, 1569, at the west door of St. Paul's Cathedral, and continued day and night until the 6th of May. The scheme, which had been announced two years before, shows that the lottery consisted of 40,000 lots of shares, at 10 shillings each, and that it comprehended a great number of good prizes, as well of ready money as of plate, and certain sorts of merchandise. The object of any profit that might arise from the scheme was the, re was the reparation of harbors and other useful public works. Lotteries did not take their origin in England. They were known in Italy at an earlier date, but from the year above names in the reign of Queen Elizabeth down to 1826, excepting for a short time following upon an act of Queen Anne, they continued to be adopted by the English government. As a source of revenue, it seems strange that so, so glaringly immoral a project should have been kept up with such sanction so long. Now, everywhere I go across the country, I see the Negro. The Negro loves the lottery, okay? And the lottery comes from European, and that's all there is to that. You might want to lie to yourself and you know say whatever you want to say in your little head, but that is the reality to the situation. Okay, I've been all across the country. I've seen Negroes lining up for this. Okay, so what we're gonna do here? Okay. Okay. So. Here we go. Now, during the, early middle, during the early Middle Ages, trials were held publicly in the marketplace, and anyone who chose could follow the proceedings. 
These were directed by the emperor's legal representative, the Sochus, the uh, show thesis, assisted by the chauffeur. Where there was a market, the pillory might be seen. For if the local authorities neglected to have it ready for immediate use, should occasion require it, they ran the risk of forfeiting the right of holding a market, which was a most serious matter in the olden time. Now, the market is where everybody is buying their food and everything, but we must have the stocks, we must have the violence prepared, which is the entertainment, okay? Which is, that's what we have today, and that's what we had in Greece, you know? I mean, that's what they had in Greece, is the entertainment. We need the violence. Okay, we need to see, we need to feel good about ourselves by seeing somebody else in a worse position. Now, much else besides was necessary. However, to become a successful merchant abroad, such a man had to speak one or more foreign languages, in particular French, to make himself familiar with foreign currencies, to be capable of reporting on the prices of commodities, the rates of exchange, and the fluctuations of the market. He had to keep on good terms with foreign rulers and rivals to adapt himself to local customs and laws, and often to take sudden decisions on his own responsibility. Court mourning would increase the demand for black or purple cloth, and coronation sent up the price of jewels, while the disbanding of free company might bring a glut of arms upon the market. Okay, so basically, these individuals had to be social understanders, social researchers, social connectors, and also social manipulators when it comes to people who are the marketers, which today would be the high-level businessmen, your CEOs and your venture capitalists, so on and so forth, okay? Now, this is day-to-day -day life. Times were clearly changing, and it, and it is no surprise to learn that 100 years later under George III, I mean George III, prostitution had become a permanent feature of daily life in London. Visits to the brothels, of which there are said to have been some 20,000 were regular items in the budget of every bachelor and those who had no budget because their means did not run to one. As a rule, gambled successfully on a general atmosphere which made many girls content with an evening meal and a bottle of wine in return for their favors. Okay? This is day to day life in the, in the male's mind. Okay? Now, people found relief from their intolerable conditions in the most popular ways in any age drinking, gambling, sex, and violence. Violence on the large scale was not common because of the rapid and savage means of repression. But on the small scale, the streets of the towns, the highways, and the village greens were never free from violent crime. At night, they were only frequented by drunk fools and those rich enough to pay their own bravos to protect them. Gambling was universal, but most flamboyant among the rich Lord Chesterfield, 1694, that self-appointed model of the ideal man in an age of reason almost left bath despite the fact that his cures seemed to be working because the stakes at the tables were too low to afford him any excitement. Okay, now, uh, that statement right there talking about uh, Lord Chesterfield was uh, an individual who got, got overcrowded. He, he, he was a highlight of what gambling does to an individual over time as he was rich in the beginning and his high level intellectuality is what made him rich and then he fell out with the gambling and he made himself the fool and we have to understand that later on during these time periods in the late 1700s you'll start seeing you'll start seeing individuals who are who are being held as the embodiment of certain activity that was carried on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, by the by a it was accepted on a standard scale. They will take this activity and embody it into one individual. And that one individual will be the activity compartmentalized in history. So you don't see the rest of the small events that built up the total, okay? I hope you understood what I'm saying. I'll be explaining that a little bit more throughout the whole thing. Now, the schooling that went on during the time period. Education was based on the seven liberal arts. Grammar, the foundation of science logic, with uh, which differentiates the true from the false. Rhetoric, the source of law. Arithmetic, the foundation of order because without numbers there is nothing. Geometry, the science of measurement. Astronomy, the most noble of the sciences. 
because it is connected with divinity and theology. And lastly, music. Medicine, though not one of the liberal arts, was an, uh, analogous to music because its object was the harmony of the human body. Of course, um, they understood that frequency controlled the human body and sounds controlled the human body back then. Okay? Now, monkeys were common pets. We just seen that last night. People are starting to bring out monkeys again as their little pets. Okay? Monkeys were common pets. Beggars were ubiquitous. Most of them crippled, blind, deceased, deformed, or disguised as such. The legless dragged themselves along by means of wooden stumps and strapped to their hands. Women were considered the snare of the devil, while at the same time the cult of the virgin made one woman the central object of love and adoration, which that happened later on in the 1600s, 1700s. Doctors uh, were admired, lawyers universally hated and mistrusted, steam was unharnessed, syphilis not yet in introduced, Leprosy still extant, gunpowder coming into use, though not yet effectively. Potatoes, tea, coffee, and tobacco were unknown. Hot spice wine was the favorite drink of those who could afford it. The common people drank beer, ale, and cider and wine. Okay, now this is talking about the 1400s right here. Okay, and when they say the adoration of the one of the cult of the virgin. That was a very small group. That wasn't a large popularized thing. And we came into a larger popularized thing when they started to enforce the, the, the virgin stereotype to bring in the Victorian age, so on and so forth. Okay. And that's one thing you have to understand is that during these dark ages, they understood the mastery of putting a spirit and a soul, which are the two different things, to a stereotype. They knew how to make a stereotype a lie. And that's what they've done in order to create American culture. So the literature that was going around at that time Medieval literature gives us a great many examples of women who did not behave in a subordinate manner, who talked back to their husbands. Sermon literature is full of examples of, dis of disobedient and nagging wives. These examples draw on common misogynistic stereotypes and are clearly meant to teach women to behave. For example, a woman is in the habit of always disobeying and, or contradicting her husband. Her husband places a table next to a river bank and tells her to sit near the table. To spite him, she moves farther away from the table and falls in the river. The husband then runs upstream to try to pull her out. When his companions tell him that he should be looking for her downstream, he says, don't you know that my wife always does the contrary thing and never the right way? I believe that she will go up against the current and not downstream as others do. A woman who gets into trouble because of her disobedience, the story warns us, should not expect to be rescued. Okay? And this is the mentality that was designed before the slave ship was picked up. We have to remember that, and I'm going to keep on reminding you about that. Because we think all of this stuff comes from the slavery mentality or what had happened during... No. This stuff was way was embedded into the motherboard before a slave ship was built. Now, medieval literature is rife with representations of insubordinate, of unruly wives. Ch Chaucer's wife of Bath and some of the women in the French Fablo are good examples. When they're talking about Chaucer's wife of Bath, they're talking about the Canterbury Tales. Whenever you read inside this book, the, uh, about Chaucer. Chaucer is the author of the Canterbury Tales. I do believe he has other literature. But you also have to understand that the Canterbury Tales are also part of the mythology structure of Christian, of, I mean of Christianity. Okay? Now, let's continue. In literature, the chief role of children was to die, usually drowned, smothered, or abandoned in a forest on the orders of some king faring 
uh, prophecy or man a husband testing a wife's endurance. Women appear rarely as mothers. They are flirts, bods, and deceiving wives in the popular tales, saints and martyrs in the drama, unattainable objects of passionate and, Ill and illicit love in the romances. Okay, so we see that the media, well, this is the literature, so at that time this would be considered the media. There was no TV, there was no phone, there was no none of these things. Okay, so we see that the media, the propaganda of the time was, all, was designed in a way to make you look at women in a negative light and also when you think in this format, that's exactly what you're going to create. So, we're going to see how far that goes. Now, the Charibari is an ass-back cavalcades were carried on legally and probably without physical violence, but they were marked by extraordinary moral violence. The policing of Moors, which I do believe that means morale, but with the metaphysic coming from the word more, that is also applied, was at the time delegated by the judicial system to the youth brotherhood, and on occasion to groups of young men who requested authorization from the mayor to surprise a particular concubinary couple, usually a priest and his mistress, to chastise them or drive away the woman. The visits of the sort often ended up in genuine violence. Uh, above all, the bands of young men abused themselves, this time without official permission by surprising lovers and making them pay a gauge, spying on priests, concubines, and knocking at the door of engaged couples. It was thus an easy matter to legitimize any plot aimed at a woman who aroused desire. We can conclude that gang rape had a place at the borderline between culture and subculture. So, this is all part of the picture, the gang rape. This is all part of the harassment of having a beautiful woman when you're out in public. This is all part of the harassment of, and the rape that occurs at the universities with the quote unquote brotherhoods, with the quote unquote fraternities. The word frat means brother, okay? So, we have to understand that. Um, that's very important because we still see the same problems today, okay? And we have to understand it doesn't come, these activities don't come from us. Now, there are also other more brutal sports, even more pleasing to the crowd. In one of the squares, a pig was enclosed in a wide, oak, wide pen and beaten to death by armed men as he ran squealing from one to the other. Among the loud laughter of those present and another, a live cat was nailed to a post and killed in spite of her desperate clawing and biting by men who with sh shorn heads and bound hands drove the life out of her by buffeting her with their heads to the sound of trumpets. These with the accompanying jest and boast bleeding backs and broken heads were rare pleasures. Okay, so what she's saying is that there was a post and they would take the cat and they would tie the cat, cat's tail to a string to the post and then they would go in with their hands tied behind their back and dive at the cat with their head and the cat would jump on their face and claw them up and rip their eyeball out and, and rip their cheek open. And um, they were sort of senseless and they didn't sort of, they didn't feel all of the pain and that's due to the type of the mental space they were in and a lot of the, disease, the diseases that they were going through and also their familiarity with death and we're all going to be talking about that in the second volume, okay. So at Village Feast not only did wrestling matches take place but also queer kinds of combats with sticks and of birch balls. Two men blindfolded each armed with a stick and holding in his hand a rope fastened to a stick, entered the arena and went round and round trying to strike at a fat goose or a pig with, uh, which was also let loose with them. It can, uh, it can easily be imagined that the greater number of the blows fell like hail on one or, or other of the principal actors in this blind combat, made shots of laughter from the spectators. So. You know, like, like I said earlier, the Asbat Cavalcades. And this is the picture right here. This is a painting of the gambling house of the medieval time periods. 
and you can see they're playing cards. So, all of this spade and tonk and all of this that we do, it ain't from us, okay? Not saying that, you know, it's, it's, you know, not saying that it's a bad, it's wholeheartedly bad thing to do, who knows? But to know the origin is the best thing, to, is the best way to go about it, because you, the, the spirituality of the scenario won't be able to combine with your soul because you will know what the essence of the element is. You see, right now, you don't know the essence of the element of, you know, gambling or playing dice or eating this type of food, reversed eel and, you know, the pork jelly. This is pork jelly right here, okay? And in Pronto, pork jelly was to be one of the main dishes. Okay, pork was also much used together with veal, uh, capons, uh, fish and spices for making jelly, which was made very strong and stiff and was considered a great delicacy. Okay? Now the reason it was considered a great delicacy is because, uh, you know, they could they could barely they could barely live they could barely eat man they barely had anything to eat with okay so that's why you see it in a jelly format as that jelly is all grease okay there's no meat there's no food really there okay now pigs pigs meat made up generally the greater part of the domestic banquets. There was no great feast at which hams, sausages, and black puddings were not served in profusion on all the tables. Okay, now, eels were eaten pickled in their own fat. Okay, now, eating eels, you know, that's a very unclean thing, but I guess, you know, and then due to the type of rivers that they had that was filled with feces, if the eels are, if the eels are swimming amongst the feces and eating the feces because eels are at the bottom of the bottom of the, of, of the river. Okay, so you're eating, you know, the scavenger of the scavenger of the scavenger is basically what's happening here. Okay, and um, you know, it's 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 grotesque, and from the activity of these animals, it's definitely going to be inside the mentality. All right. Uh, a lot of the water food that they ate, um, the shrimps, the squids, the whole thing, okay? I got, and the black puddings that are mentioned here is actually uh, pig blood mixed with oatmeal and is wrapped into a sausage type of thing. And uh, they eat that for breakfast, all right? Now, the clothing, about this time, men took to wearing shorter clothes than ever, having them made to fit tightly to the body after the manner of dressing monkeys, which was very shameful and immodest, and the sleeves of their coats and doublets were slit open so as to show their fine white shirts. Now understand that shirts at one time was a very um, despicable garment to wear. They didn't like a shirt was what you wore when you went on your penance, when you served for mankind, when you, you know, atoned for your sins, you'd have to wear a shirt. And that's what they would whip you with serving your penance through the city, okay? Now, they wore their hair so long that it concealed their face and even their eyes. And on their heads, they wore cloth caps nearly a foot or more high. They also carried, according to fans,